edge router down here that's providing service to a bunch of customers. Um, and uh, one of those customers is the surveillance target. Somewhere within the ISP's cloud, there's this service provider management network. This is how ISPs run their networks. They have uh, SNMP monitoring servers and a bunch of other machines in that network that they use for uh, uh, running all of their gear. Um, in that service provider management network is the mediation device, uh, hopefully behind another firewall. So this is how this is supposed to work. The, if you look at the red line, traffic flows, f the mediation device sends an interception request out to the IAP edge router and the edge router collects data from the surveillance target and sends it back to the mediation device. This is um, a sort of an idealistic attack scenario. The, the attacker out on the internet sends the, his interception request to the router and the router sends the intercepted traffic back out to the attacker server on the internet. So how do we accomplish this? Well, we have to send an unauthorized interception request. Um, again, it's a single UDP packet. It's an SNMP v3 request. It has to have um, the correct username and password. You have to know the correct username and password with one caveat which I'll discuss. Um, you also have to have the SNMP v3 engine ID, engine boots, and engine time values. Uh, those are three numbers that SNMP v3 uses to prevent replay of uh, requests. You can get them from the router as long as you can talk SNMP to it. You don't need a username or a password to get them. It will hand them out to anybody who asks. Um, and uh, they can be shared between uh, 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 different people. So if you ask for it, you can hand it to Bob and he can send the, and he can use it. So um, uh, it doesn't matter what source address you're coming from. Um, the, the attacker would need to be able to interact with the interface, uh, um, the, the, at least to send a packet that the interface will receive. So packet filters could play a role here and I'll talk about that too. Um, obviously because it's a single UDP packet, it can be spoofed, um, but there are caveats to that. Um, also encryption might prove to be an obstacle and I emphasize might. Uh, so um, the first thing you want to do, as I said, is you got to have the right username and password. So. Um, it turns out that there was this vulnerability in SNMP v3 implementations which was disclosed in the middle of the summer of 2008 uh, that, that, allow, that allowed somebody to access an SNMP v3 interface without knowing the password. It affected a bunch of different implementations. Uh, and the way, th so um, SNMP v3 messages are actually authenticated using an HMAC. Um, and the HMAC is calculated with the password. So um, when a uh, router receives an, H uh, an SNMP v3 request, uh, th they're supposed to, the way the RFC is written, it's supposed to take that HMAC out and, and check to make sure it's 12 bytes long. If it's not 12 bytes long, it throws the HMAC away. Uh, and it throws the packet away. Um, if it is 12 bytes long, then it goes further and does verification. It turns out that that particular piece of code was not actually implemented by a bunch of different SNMP v3 implementations. So regardless of how long the HMAC was, uh, the, the software would proceed to the verification step. Um, and that function there is the actual verification function. The software would go calculate its own HMAC and then it would compare it with the HMAC that was in the packet. Uh, and it used the length from the packet to do that comparison operation. So if you send one byte as your HMAC and that one byte happens to be the correct first byte for the real HMAC that you're supposed to send, uh, your packet is accepted as valid. Uh, in practice, this means that you send 256 requests, one for each possible byte, and one of them will be, will be accepted. So you don't, need, you don't need the password. Um, as I mentioned, this was disclosed in June of 2008. Uh, it impacted a bunch of different uh, vendors. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of the iOS software trains that support lawful intercept were never vulnerable to this vulnerability. And both the vulnerability and lawful intercept have existed in iOS version trains for many years. So um, it's, uh, it, 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 obviously Cisco had two, uh, two source branches here. Uh, one of them had the bug and one of them didn't. Um, I did find one version in particular that, that, that had both the bug and the feature. Um, uh, there were probably others. I didn't exhaustively search the list, but the Cisco 10,000 series router supports this particular version train of iOS and it had both the vulnerability and the lawful intercept feature. Um, another thing I, well, I want to say is that, it, that this particular series of router supports um, IP VPNs uh, and IP VPNs are a personal pet peeve of mine so I like uh, grinding this axe. Um, when I think of a VPN, I think of encryption and there are a bunch of people who, out there who sell VPN systems that are encryption based. 
but the the service provider industry sells service provider VPNs and they use the word VPN but these VPNs do not have any encryption in them uh, and when you and I think it's misleading I think there's a lot of companies out there that buy these things thinking that they're buying encryption um, and if you press the service providers about it they'll say it's okay our networks are not subject to surveillance so it turns out that yes they are um, and uh, in fact you can specify a VPN that you would like to listen to within the interception request. Uh, so, so in fact um, uh, you know there is a reason that, uh, that uh, uh, it, it, there, there's a good reason for making a distinction between encrypted VPNs and other kinds of VPNs that are not encrypted. Anyway, um, let's say uh, that, that the router that you want to target has been patched uh, and, and that's probably uh, a realistic scenario because the vulnerability was disclosed two years ago. A lot of people don't patch their routers very often because uh, it, it's complicated. It involves downtime, et cetera. So there may still be some machines out there that are unpatched. But um, if it's patched, you've got to brute force the username and password. It, it turns out that SNMP v3 makes this easy. Um, th it provides verbose error messages whenever you try a username and password. If you send a bad username, it'll tell you the username was bad. So you can try usernames until you get one that works. And then if you try a password and it turns out that your password was bad, it'll tell you it was the password that was bad. And you can keep trying passwords until you get, you get that right too. Uh, so it's pretty easy to brute force. Um, and one of the things you might think if you were doing all that brute forcing uh, is that you'd be, you'd be caught because it would generate a bunch of logging information. It would freak out that someone was trying to break into it. Well, it turns out that it doesn't do that either. Um, the, the documentation seems to so let me go back. In SNMP v2, they didn't have usernames and passwords. They had community strings, which was sort of like a, a password without a username. Um, and if you configured your router to send uh, traps, um, uh, uh, authentication failure traps specifically, uh, then if you send an SNMP v2 request to the router with the wrong community string, the router would generate this authentication failure trap. So people running SN large networks of, with SNMP devices could tell if people were trying to crack their community strings on their network. The documentation strongly implies that, that this is also true for SNMP v3. That if you have these traps uh, configured on your router and someone's trying to crack your username and password, they're gonna, those traps are going to get generated and you'll be able to know that this is going on. But it turns out it actually doesn't work. I tried a bunch of different iOS versions and, and no traps or informs are generated uh, when, when uh, bad usernames and passwords are, are used. And so I told Cisco about it because I figured it was an implementation bug. Uh, and they decided after, after deliberating for a while that um, it was actually a problem with the documentation. Uh, and so uh, there's actually a, this bug number down here in CCO you can look up. It tells you that the documentation is wrong and in fact they don't generate any traps or informs when authentication failure occurs. So the other thing is that you'd think that once you got in and you started your wiretap up, um, uh, that would result in some sort of audit trail. But actually, that doesn't result in, in an audit trail. Uh, the, the person, so inside the MIB for the interception request, you can actually turn notification off. You can say, don't tell anyone about this wiretap, keep it a secret. It's between you and me, router. Um, so th this, is, this is really bizarre um, in, in my mind. Uh, uh, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip slides a little bit. <laughs> what kind of technology allows the user to turn the logs off, right? Unix shells, you get log, you get syslogged, unless you're root, right? Um, DHCP servers have logs. SMTP servers have logs. HTTP servers have logs. All these systems are constantly generating audit trails all the time. Um, this is the only technology that, that, that I think I've ever seen where, where the user can just turn the logging off. Um, we know that this audit trail problem exists in a bunch of different architectures. It's not just the Cisco interface. It's not just Cisco's uh, issue. It's actually something that exists in telecommunications infrastructure, which was designed based on completely different uh, technology by totally different people. Um, and it's been attacked in the past. Uh, so there's this IEEE Spectrum article called The Athens Affair that was published in July of 2007. It's a really good read. Um, there was this, uh, and, and, and th this involved an Ericsson cellular phone switch in Greece. Um, no Cisco equipment was involved in this case. Um, what happened was that the, the switch started crashing and Ericsson's third level support guys were sent down to Greece to find out what was wrong with the switch. And so they, they, um, they started looking at the core dumps and they discovered that there was assembly code in the core dumps that their engineers didn't write. Uh, 
And it turns out it was spying on people. So that's got to be the technical support escalation nightmare of all time. Um, and, and, and what it did is access the lawful intercept feature in the switch uh, and use it to spy on a number of members of the Greek government. Uh, and um, the, the reason that no one knew that this was going on is because of the architecture was very similar. Uh, there's a system for, for provisioning the wiretaps um, and all the logging is built into that provisioning system which is much like the mediation device and then the actual switch where the wiretaps actually occurred, um, the, the, it, it had no audit trail. Um, so th there are fundamental requirements, that, the architectural requirements that, that are going into these lawful intercept systems of different variety that are driving this, uh, this design decision. And I'll talk later about why this decision was made. But I, I, um, I want to point out a couple of other things. The audit, uh, in addition to the fact that this can be attacked, um, it, it's also important to point out that allegations of misuse of the system cannot be investigated. If somebody says, hey, I was wiretapped illegally, oh, I'm sorry, there's no logs. So we can't figure out whether or not you're lying. Um, so that's another issue. Uh, but if, if you think about it, um, it's, you know, in Europe, there are these data retention laws um, that require uh, ISPs to, to store all of the, the audit trails from all of these systems that the ISPs are running. They have to store the source and destination of, of, of every communication uh, for, for six months to two years in Europe. Um, so, so there are laws that require all of your activity on the internet, if you're in Europe, uh, to, to, to be retained so that it can be investigated in the future if there's some allegation that you did something wrong. But the law, the, the, the wiretapping system in the exact same networks does not have any audit trail at all and there is no way to go back and, and investigate an allegation of misuse. So what's up with that? Um, it, it seems very clear that that's hypocritical. Um, and, uh, so, so, um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go on to the next issue. But w once I get further into this talk, I'll explain exactly why they designed it that way and and how they can design it differently so that it doesn't have to work that way. Um, so another neat feature of this system is that the output stream is very flexible. Once you've provisioned your wiretap, you can send the output to any destination on the global internet over any port using four different encapsulation schemes, one of which is, or two of which are UDP based, one of which is TCP and one of which is STCP based. So you can send this thing anywhere and you, make, you can make it look like anything. For example, you can send it on port 53 as a bunch of UDP packets so it looks like DNS traffic and I included a picture of Dan Kaminsky because every time I think about DNS I think of Dan. Um, now there are a couple of things the ISP can do to protect this interface and in fact if the ISP configures the interface properly, uh, it, 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 they can in fact pre prevent these attacks fairly well. Uh, I just don't think that most of them are and I'll explain why. Uh, w one of the key things that ISPs like to do to protect uh, stuff on their network um, is, uh, is, is use access lists and all of the SNMP v3 hardening guides and uh, information from Cisco recommends these infrastructure access control lists that say that we'll only accept SNMP v3 from our management. Management LAN. Uh, and I figure a lot of ISPs have those, those access lists configured. Um, so in theory you can spoof this interception request but in practice you probably don't want to. Uh, because if you're cracking usernames and passwords you're going to want those error, message to, uh, error messages to come back to you so you're not going to want to be spoofing. Um, if you, um, so I'll just go on. The, the consequence of this is, is that I think that this is a more realistic attack scenario. Somebody has owned a machine in the service provider management network and they use that machine to send the interception request to the edge router. Uh, and then the edge router sends the, uh, the wiretap to some system out on the internet. Um, you don't have to keep control of that machine for very long. You only have to send one packet to initiate the wiretap but you probably want to do it from within the service provider LAN. But service lands are impenetrable. Um, oh, you know, no, they're not. Uh, some people argue that that if you're in the service land, you basically have you own the ISP, and so you could perform uh, w wiretapping if you wanted to, regardless of whether or not the system exists. There's a couple of flaws in that logic. The the first thing is that there are a lot of people who have access to the service land uh, who are not authorized to um, to be engaged in uh, in wiretapping. Uh, and and uh, another thing is that the existence of the wiretapping system makes it very easy to do 
this. And so it becomes more attractive to an attacker when it's cheap. Um, there is a frack article from a few, uh, it's almost 10 years ago, I think, that talks about if you get in a router and you have enable access, you can configure.